That's uh, Sexton and Farrell. That's uh, Sexton talking about uh, the injury not feeling too good at the moment. Uh, James Tracy is with us in studio. James, good morning to you. How are you? Thanks for having me back. Um, what did you make of the whole thing? What was your immediate kind of... How did you feel at the end of that? Uh, just delighted for the lads. Like, it's it's not an easy thing to do. Um, like, four times ever and, and getting the opportunity. I actually think there's more pressure having it at home because there's so many distractions. Uh, Dan Levy touched on it um, when he's in the late late about... You know, the the last one, they were kind of in a hotel, um, kind of in the suburbs, and it was quiet. And you know, you're you're you can kind of calm yourself into feeling just another game. But when you're in the middle of of, it's an amazing. Obviously, it's it's incredible that you know you're in the, you're in the middle of town, buzzing, you've yeah. family, but you know you've you've tickets and you've you just loads of distractions. You're totally accessible to everybody. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So fair play to them for for dealing with that. It's a um, good point, actually, and I haven't heard it mentioned yet. But there, I saw f- photographs of the team bus outside the Shelburne, and there's loads of people at it. Yeah. And like, <laughs> I, you know, it would be easy for that to be like. Oh, we're just going to oh, going to pick up the trophy. Yeah, it's yeah. a nice little jaunt for us today, and then Manu Tulagi smacked you in the face. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so you know, it's it's an emotional dump, and and you know, I don't want to say it, it's an incredible thing to have that, but it's definitely uh, a distraction from you know keeping the main thing the main thing. And uh, fair play to them; it was a real kind of cup final feel to us. Um, you know, I think. They probably didn't get into their flow, but when it mattered, the big moments, they won all of those big moments. So, sorry, I'm just going to say, does that explain the early nerves then? Or uh, what, what, what would you refer to as nerves? Like Sexton had a wayward pass and Hugo Keenan has the terrible kick to touch early on. Like, does that does that explain little things like that early on in the game? Uh, I think so, yeah. They just didn't get into their flow. Uh, you know, you need a bit of continuity. You need, like, and you know, a few things to go well early and... Uh, the one thing I'd say they did exceptional is after each mistake like that, you know, uh, they followed it up with a really big win. So, you know, the Hugo kick to touch where that came from, like a, yeah, as I said, wayward pass. So he salvages that. He's, he's turning the wrong way and he's a guy coming his right side. So he's, he's set up either for to be blocked down. Um, now, he definitely hooks it more than he probably would have <laughs> liked. Then he goes backwards. But he was set up for him to, to hit it wrong. But, you know, they, they get a huge penalty off of that. You know, um, P takes a really good ball going forward in the line out and they get a huge penalty. Um, and then, you know, England come back in and you have, like, big line out moments and big defensive moments. I think Peter Manny, Johnny with huge hits. I think James Lowe was defence was incredible. You know, I think we've talked about his attack um, over the years and, and maybe he's had a bit to work on with his defence which he said himself in the media but his defensive display was incredible he, he had so many like, yeah, huge, huge moments yeah kept giving me crap for my D was the <laughs> immortal line after one of the press conferences or yeah. after one of the games but um, yeah actually I'd forgotten about that but he's like absolutely giving it loads and the hair is out at one yeah. after he's bundled somebody into touch um, James Ryan's leadership is also kind of you know it, before uh, sex that goes off and everyone's like oh what's going to happen now and now it's kind of seamless which isn't an overnight thing either that's been a long process for him to get to the point where he's fully comfortable with that yeah so the in fairness that like they've invested uh, well they've, they've seen the talent that he was like you know he's played for Ireland before he played for Leinster you know he was he's, he was earmarked early doors um, but he's really come into his own and I think uh, it's it's the little things he does that makes him exceptional. So um, there was a huge, huge turning point in the game when um, Peter Manny goes off for Jack Conan. I thought Peter had an exceptional game. Um, he cleaned up a lot of yeah, stuff that could almost went wrong, you know, where the throw might have been a little bit too high. He, sa- he salvages that. Um, there was kind of scrappy ball off the line out again it could easily be knocked on he salvages that he's, he's incredible at just being kind of the glue for that team as well as coming up with huge defensive moments um, but Jack Conan comes into the game and uh, that first mall he manages to, to get through See, his, his first moment is that line out gets through dislodges the ball England are a serious attacking position um, Jameson Gibson Park then clears the ball and all of a sudden uh, you know we're we're now in the English half. It's a, it's a scrum to them because Low Low knocks it on. Um, we give away a penalty, which is I wouldn't necessarily say I agree with it, but yeah, we give away a penalty at the scrum, so we're back under the cosh, and and that's when you need your leader. Um, and James Ryan line out pressure. They kind of fumble it forward into the five. He gets back. 
he's the one who makes the tackle on Genge and chops him and gives the opportunity for Baird to make that poach. And if you remember, like that was a huge moment in the game. Yeah. And that's what that was. Yeah. His head's dropped immediately. Exactly. So then we kick it up the field. Now it comes. You know, we're talking about how, how Ireland have matured there, and then Sexton's intellect, mid-game intellect. So we uh, we do a maul to try suck them in when they're down a man if you're thinking uh, but like this play doesn't work unless you actually get the, the mall moving forward so you can see their uh, their the, the level of detail as well you know you win it at the front because you want to slightly creep to the five so the nine can come up because it's a five plus one line out so now the nine can come in when it creeps to, to the five and go forward they get sucked in because it's it's right on the edge and then they're down a man Sexton crossfield kick Hansen um, I think it was Robbie and um, Jimmy O'Brien uh, hit them over the line and that, that was all she wrote then we got the scrum and, and that's what when they came back Bundy gives it to Robbie and, and, and that's the game but all of those little wins all the way from that line out of Jack Conan getting through to just moment after moment after moment you had people kind of stepping up and, and executing and so when you're the opposition and like you've had a, a relieving penalty in the middle of it that you think is kind of okay we've weathered the storm but actually it just comes straight back at you Yeah, that's the bit where it's a wave of of excellence from Ireland, where the the you're you you if you're the opposition and you're constantly losing tiny little battles, it's death by a thousand cuts. Is that what that feels like? Yeah, and 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 that's the momentum thing. If you could bottle up momentum, you'd be you'd be a wealthy person. It's hard, like it's an intangible thing, but. Uh, it, 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 we touched on the start of the game of, of the little errors or whatever and not getting into the flow so when you do get into the flow the momentum just starts to everything just starts to work um, and, and I think uh, all those win- little moments of wins they just either swing the momentum for you or if you lose them they swing them against you and, and you're just kind of trying to weather that storm until you can get it back to, to go back to Shane's point about the first half and that not being there for them um, in a way we shouldn't be as worried. I, I was a little bit worried about the game afterwards. You're like, oh, yeah. this is, you know, is, is this how we're going to play from now on? Will it, will it always be nervy like this? Or is that because so much is on the line? And like, I know they're saying that they haven't been talking about the Grand Slam, but they have. Like, clearly, they were like, this is, we've got, a, our, we've got uh, England and France at home. We're the best team in the world. Of course, we're looking for the Grand Slam. So all the pressure is there building nonstop and, and they've got their ways of dealing with it. But it, like, do we need to take this game in isolation? completely separately from when we play South Africa it's going to be a completely different occasion and and it, it, all the pressure won't be the same as it was in this one game where we were at home as you say um, is there a lesson to be learned from that and that second half is more who we are as opposed to that first half definitely I think there's loads of lessons I wouldn't be worried about it I think winning ugly is is better than losing pretty in terms of uh, you know you look at like likes of Scotland I think Scotland are probably the the best first half side or best 20 first 20 minute side in the world but um they seem to to fade away and like they can play all this amazing stuff but um we've we've had their number for a long time um this Ireland team I think I touched on it earlier where they weren't in their flow and sometimes that just happens you have like a game where it just doesn't go for you England did a really good job of of um of folding around the the rock to 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 start negate Ireland's attack and put pressure on them and and I think we were just a little bit off with the the accuracy of passes and and uh, the thing that we can take so much joy out of is how we dealt with that adversity again like obviously Scotland's was a lot clearer because he had Josh thrown into the line out and Keane in the middle but like there was so many moments where we could have put our head down and England would have scored and you're talking about momentum open like the floodgates open and then that's a lot harder to deal with than just winning the next moment okay we've messed up there that hasn't gone right what are we going to do next and I think they're exceptional whether it be Ryan Omani, Sexton, um, James Lowe. It was just even James Gibson Park was coming in with with big shots. Uh, they, they weathered the storm so well. I feel like like we've barely this morning mentioned Dan Sheehan's name at all. And like what a performance he had! Like how not bad, not <laughs> decent. And we weren't even sure last week if he was going to get to play James. But like how impressed were you with like you even look at the the age profile? I think I think Dan is twenty four. So next World Cup cycle he'll be twenty eight. Like there's but there's a lot of players in this Irish setup that are of a similar age profile which is fantastic but Dan's performance was just 
impeccable um, yeah incredible and, and what an asset to have um, for, for line out attack plays and, and just general attack um, as oh, listen don't get me wrong he's he's a freak at everything but uh, he's so fast and strong like it's it's he's the pace of a winger but he's like you know a giant hooker um, and you, you look at his try um, I'm definitely not taking that to the house if I go through but he's got that pace and, and dynamism to make it look like no one got near him you know that gap's actually only open for a millisecond versus um, but, it, but it's interesting how, how they they've They've attacked that a few times against England. You know the the seam of the line out uh, at the back. England clearly don't uh, put as much attention on that. They're obviously focusing on line speed and stopping them all first. Um, I think it's Genge at the back hits it way too early, and then you have the detail of uh, Gibson Park and Low dummying down the blind side to hold the fold, and you're leaving the tail gunner on his own. And Ireland did a really good job of executing to, to spot that and giving Sheen the chance. When do they spot it? Do they spot it? Well, as video. They... You'd you'd, you'd, you'd an- analyze that because if you think back to Earls's try, uh, the last time we beat them in the Aviva, when Jack Conan catches it and hits it back inside. Oh yeah. That's the same issue for England where it's the back, the tail gunner and, and the next guy. So it's usually a prop. Their relationship and understanding of, of the, the, the call it the seam between the line out and the backs and the effect that hitting them all early or standing too tight or can have on the, the phase play. You can see that in video and you see people's habits um, and you can come up with plays that... that because I was wondering if it's actually in the game itself they're deciding this is what we're going to do off this particular line out because we can see that they've, they're have they wandering a bit slowly or they're a little bit lazy or their animation is wrong is it or is that kind of preordained when we're taking the penalty we're going to do this because we know let's 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 run that because we've worked on it yeah you'd run it because you'd worked on it and, and you'd have like a you've, you've a playbook of plays um, but you, you sit down and you you see okay this is every defence uh, system has a flaw so like you know it has a strength and then it has a flaw so it's figuring out a few plays but like when Josh comes around there everyone else has done their job the the wing and nine have run run down the blind to, to, to hold the blind side defence uh, Josh does a really good job of getting outside the, the tail gunner to open that space up for Sheen. But if the you know if Genj doesn't hit it, then there's another option as well. You know, it's not that's option A. Maybe yeah. it might not even be option A. It might be option B. But it was on. You'll have like a couple of options that'll work, um, or it'll just get you a good go forward and you you, you get into your flow. Okay. Um, talk to us a bit about the scrum because it, it looked a bit messy in the first half and again we don't have a clue what's causing this like is it the referee being a bit slow to get everybody in is it actually that they had slight superiority for a while what was your instinct about watching that I was very frustrated to be honest so um, I find like if if you listen to the audio in the in the first scrum um, Yako talks to, to Porter about staying square and keeping his bind up and it's just like the bias is already in his head of like, you know, if, if I'm scrumming against someone and the refs just said that to them before the first scrum, I'm like, okay, so I now have two options. I can collapse it and he's going to be like, you didn't keep your elbow up. Or I can go in and the ref's going to be like, the other fella's driving in. You know, and the fact it's your own ball as well, that ups your chances of getting the penalty even more. So that sort of chat, in my opinion, needs to happen in, in the changing room before because you, you chat to the ref before the game, uh, the front rows, and it should be left there. I feel like saying it out loud there, it's just like, it always seems to lead to a biased decision. I thought Ireland uh, smashed them in that first scrum and I was, even though we gave away the penalty, I was delighted because okay. I, I thought that's where they were going to try to come for us and it really set a statement of intent from Ireland in that first scrum. So sometimes giving away a penalty okay. as long as you're dominant because the English, they're all patting each other on the back but they know that, you know, they were hammered in that first scrum and, and like, even though you're kind of like, eh, yeah, you have that feeling of okay, this isn't fake. Yeah, this isn't going to be as good a day as maybe we thought. Right, that's really interesting. If you if you are a porter in that situation and you feel like, uh oh, we're going to be refereed specifically, and he didn't say it to everybody, what do you do? Do you go to Sexton and say this is bullshit? Look, you've got a you got a RDA. There's no no porter is prone to refereeing games himself sometimes. So yeah. like. Do you just have to suck it up? You have to suck it up. Uh, there's nothing you can do. And I, I've yet to see anyone turn around. Now, you can show, like, 
as good a picture as you can in the scrum, but you're also depending on what the prop opposite you is trying to make you look like well, you're now doing they're cheating. or doing. Knowing yeah. that they're like, well, it, I got it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like, I do the same. If, if, uh, if uh, someone opposite me is, is has been given out to before we've done anything, yeah. of course I'm going to try and make them look bad. Yeah. You know, like, I, I can, you, we're, we're there to win games, you know, like, so you can be clever and try and milk stuff. What did you make of how Jakob Piper arrived at the, the red card decision? Because, like, Quinny was saying this morning, well, he didn't have much choice steward in, in what he was doing and maybe a yellow, yellow card would have sufficed whereas Brian O'Driscoll was saying on ITV at the weekend like there is a duty of care there on Stewart's behalf and red card by the rule book was the right decision what was your take? So at the time I didn't uh, I didn't think it was a red um, live because as it unfolds um, so Ireland great attack Hansen about to get his hands free and it's going to be um, a two on one with the last man who's in the backfield who's Freddie Stewart so he sees it early he's trying to close so at that moment you've you've pretty much no option apart from try hit the second last man who is Hugo man and ball so as he catches it try hit him because if he catches it clean you know he just picks you off and, and low scores in the corner he actually sees pretty early uh, Freddie Stewart that the ball's not going to ground now so in, in that split second he's like okay you're now gone from trying to make a tackle to is the ball going to bounce up to me it's a free play um, you know is he going to knock it on and maybe I could you know salvage it and, and run the, the length of the pitch this is all in a split second so like yeah. you know in fairness to him he 100% did not mean it right yeah 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 but I watched it back last night and unfortunately even though he did not mean it and like if I was Freddie Stewart I'd feel so hard done by it, but at the end of the day it's it's not about the intent it's about the duty of care and it was reckless but when I say it was reckless there's, there's guys that are reckless in terms of they're going to absolutely whack you and they get it wrong where they're too high he was not trying to tackle Hugo's bending down to pick up the ball and that and he and Freddie Stewart's trying to pull out of it, mm. and that's the only reason he turns and, and hits him with an elbow. So I I feel unbelievably sorry for Freddie Stewart because he didn't one hundred percent didn't mean it, but you can't fly into someone and, and and hit them in the head with your elbow, and and that's the hard part. It's like if I'm on the other side, I feel like it's unbelievably harsh, but at the same time, when you look at it. Um, when you look at the video, it's like yeah, you, you know, you can't whack someone in the head with your elbow. So yeah, so live. I thought it was yellow, but watching it, but that, like seeing a replay, it was definitely red. That's the point as well, the discipline thing, because Ireland didn't pick up a card across the whole Six Nations. So like, that's mad. That, that's unreal. Yeah, like if you can do that in the World Cup, you're happy out. That's incredible. Yeah, and and I'm sure that, that might have been a goal for them. Would have been their discipline. I don't know, um, but I know they would have set out. They set out to it to win a Grand Slam, but that's not the full stop. And they've been very clear about that in the, in the in the media and internally of, yes, let's win a Grand Slam, but that's we're not going to be just happy with that. We're not going to be done with that. And it's not about getting to a semi-final or not winning a knockout game. It's about winning the World Cup. It's it's actually believing in the team that we have and, and winning a World Cup and not just being happy to be better than the, the people here before. Um, what's Sexton like? in the aftermath of um, stuff like this what's he like to be around and why why has he been why has his evolution as captain worked so well for him at this stage of his career do you think he's great crack he's uh, he's wild crack actually uh, when he gets going and I think he saves himself for you know it's like he doesn't let you know let 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 loose until the right moments um, but yeah he's great fun and like to, like They'll all be of a few sore heads today, like yesterday. The day after is always the always the big Best one. Best day, because yeah, you're, just because you're you know you've you're a bit tired and huge emotional dump, but you've kind of um, well, the corporate, had a, the corporate stuff is over. Yeah, exactly. Had had a um, had a good night's sleep and and ready to go and had get a full day at it. So I'm sure they had great fun. Um, but yeah, it's been incredible watching him grow. Um, He's always been a leader, so I don't want to say grow as a leader, but just grow into that role as captain. And I feel like he's been empowered uh, by by that coaching ticket to to grab a hold of the team. And I think um, you know Stuart would have would have talked about you know a player led team in Leinster, and I feel like Andy Farrell has hit the nail on the head um, with this Irish team of of just giving him the reins to a certain extent and and letting them be themselves and play as they want to play and and. 
um, enabling them to be with this world class side. Yeah, because we say these things, right? But actually, um, what it means on a practical level is that they have they they continue to develop and evolve. And I think that's the bit about the game plan too, is that they'll take the lessons from the England game and then they'll use those and they'll get better themselves as opposed yeah. to here's how we play and it got us to this point. And that's if we just do this a little bit better, we'll continue to win because that's not going to happen. No, and you have to keep evolving uh, because you know when you're the best side in the world, the, the the bad side of that is everyone's looking at your games. Every single team's looking at your games. Yeah. Like, okay, one, what can we copy that we could do uh, and put our own spin on? And then two, it's like everyone's coming up with a game plan to beat you. And then as soon as one of them figures it out, everyone just copies that. So. Uh, you just got to keep moving and keep staying ahead of the pack. Um, and I think w- they've done a great job as well of, of building depth and giving experience to yeah. to different guys in different positions and finding your role in the team. I think that's important as well, find, knowing your strengths and finding your role in that team. Those injured players who all got to go up and be part of the celebration, that's a pretty good team that we have right there on the bench who are unavailable for selection. Um, one other thing to touch on here, um, Colin was saying he was down in Cork over the weekend. It's a bit of an issue that it's mostly Leinster out there. Any, um, Is this an issue? Uh, well, I could see... Well, it's not an issue, but... You know, you can you you want you know to be uh, to have people playing where you're from, and I, I can understand that side of things. But uh, you know, Andy Farrell's picking the the best team available, and, and uh, like I'd I'd like anyone to try debate me off of who you'd have in versus the the twenty three that he picks. I think um, I think the Lancaster thing is really important to um, pay testimony to here today as well because. Uh, his imprints are definitely on the evolution of the individuals and a fair bit, you would say, on the style of play as well, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, I Listen, the Irish rugby's in in, um, in probably the best spot it's it's ever been and I think we've been very lucky with um, a few of the, the leaders, uh, coaches we've had over the years for the different periods and we needed those, those different characters for those different times, you know, I think... Uh, I think Joe you changed the mentality of of Ireland in general in terms of we can beat the All Blacks, we can be the best in the world, um, and I, and I think that was a a pivotal turn in kind of the mindset of of Irish players. And then when you know when you're you're a young guy looking up at these guys, it's achievable, it's attainable, and and then you know you believe in it more, and um, you realise that the the standards that need to be held to to reach that level, but um, it's an exciting time um, to be Irish. Last thing is um, the bit where Piper turns around and goes, "Every time, every time I look around, one is lying on the ground. What's going on here? It, it has to stop." Uh, there were fake injuries. A go go. It's one of the things that really frustrates me, and um, like I think, I think you need to punish it. So. Ireland and and all of the the teams that are good to watch like New Zealand uh, who want to actually play rugby and and, and not get into um, just killing the game and and these little things but um, French teams do it uh, against Leinster the whole time as well where they have these fake injuries and they they all always seem to be able to play on and they always seem to be in the biggest moments where the momentum swung in the favour of of either of the of the other team, uh, and I think there has to be some sort of rule change or solution to it. You know, I think maybe the pl- the the injured player, if you want to call it, uh, has to leave the field until the next set of play is over. Uh, maybe that's a solution. But then the downside to that is if you're actually injured, you're losing a man for for no reason. But I just there has to be a consequence to it. I think it's, it's the it's it's professional foul in my opinion. Um, and you know it's so clear that they're they're faking it, and yeah. because you you look you go through the game and the timestamps, it's every big moment where we have you know either a big line out or we've won a big moment, someone's down, and they, you know they're killing it, they're like oh giving it the <laughs> the big one, and then all of a sudden they're perfect. The magic spray, comes the magic spray, them. exactly. Yeah, it's so frustrating, but. Uh, I'm not sure of the solution, but I think that would definitely disincentivize it. We need to come up with some way of disincentivizing it. We'll start our campaign here. James, that was brilliant. Thanks a million for joining us. That's uh, James Tracy giving us his thoughts on Ireland's Grand Slam.